So the presentation that I'd like to give today is a little bit about the, <clears throat> the work that we do at Corteva to uh, bring new precision phenotypings, uh, new precision phenotyping methods forward. So I lead the precision phenotyping group within the seed product development group, which means that we're really focused on bringing novel technologies to breeders. And the reason that we, we, we are interested in that goes back to this uh, formula right here. Basically, this is the breeder's equation, which really allows us to see that the response to selection is based on the heritability and the uh, selection intensity or the um, response to the selection itself. So, um, so basically, we have the ability to um, get a faster response to the selection if we can modify some of these component pieces to make it more effective and more efficient. On the right-hand side here, you can see a um, graphic that we typically use to describe the process by which we create new commercial varieties and hybrids, where we basically take our elite germplasm, we put it into this cycle and we recombine it over time. We test it um, over multiple generations, going from uh, a very large number of entries to a very small number of entries through multiple years of testing. And the reality is that um, it's been traditionally less costly for us to genotype many of these materials and much more costly for us to phenotype these materials. So going out and collecting data um, is, is much more expensive than saying running some markers on the, um, on the material. And so typically what we do is we spend a lot of time genotyping materials at the early stages. And then later on, as we do the testing in the field, we expand the amount of phenotyping that we do. And this allows us to select out the best commercial varieties and hybrids. But the reality is that if we can get this to be more efficient by, um, by making this phenotyping less expensive, then we can push the phenotyping up higher into this uh, area here and collect more data and make better selections. So if you think about this equation again and, and say, how do we increase this equation from maybe a, a molecular marker perspective or a genetic perspective? We can do this by ha having markers that are more specific to the specific traits we want to select for, so gene-specific markers. Or we can increase the diversity of the gene genetics in our, our pool. If we want to increase uh, and, and improve this, we might take, um, we might genotype more plants. And that to do that, we had to reduce the cost of markers. Now, from a phenotyping perspective, how can we affect this? We can do that by uh, phenotyping better. So reducing the error that we associate with each of the phenotypes we collect and by phenotyping more uh, genotypes and reducing the costs and the impediments to that. And by doing that, we can then re a return a better return on our investment and time. And the reason why that's important is because in reality, we know that climate change is going to be affecting us as a, an entire global society. Here is a quote that I got from the uh, North America um, Weather Service website, which says that without adapting to the changing climate, said some Midwestern and Southern ca counties could see a decline in yields by more than 10% over the next 25 years. That's pretty dramatic amount of reduction in yield potential for those different counties. And at the same time, on the right-hand side, you can see that we're going to be increasing the consumption over time of calories. So here's a projection of the amount of consumption of calories per person. Um, and then over the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years, we can see that we're going to increase the consumption of calories by 35 to 56%. So that's pretty dramatic that we're going to be possibly decreasing the amount of yield on some acres and potentially increasing the size of the population overall, which means that we need to be more efficient on those acres that we have. And that means that we need to increase 
the uh, response. Sorry, I should be saying hectares rather than acres. I'm more used to saying acres, but I should say hectares. Um, that's that really drives the response to um, to the, the selection. So I'm going to go through some examples specifically, and I want you to think through as you as we talk about this your own your own um, uh, uh, experience of data collection. So one of the reasons that we have um, problems potentially with the data collection methods that we've used historically is that there are impediments to the way that we as humans can actually see and respond to the different phenotypes in the field. So if you look at this particular photo, here's an individual trying to collect data, and you can see how difficult it would be in this giant field of soybeans to collect, to collect data on your phone. Here he's on his phone collecting data one data point at a time. Here you can see this um, that uh, basically if we have one individual, this is these are real data. We had one individual go out to the field and collect data of, of a score on one day. And then a couple of days later, they went out to the field and collected the exact same score on the exact same field. And you can see that this one individual had quite a bit of variation. Now, in general, they agree with themselves with about how good or how bad the plots are for this particular score, but there is quite a bit of variation. And this variation can cause you to have reduction in accuracy when you're trying to, say, select the things that you want to go forward or not go forward. So for example, on one day, this individual called this particular plot a one, and on a different day, the individual called the same plot a seven using the exact same metrics. And so by doing, um, by having this subjectivity of scoring, you do introduce error. In addition to that, um, there's a limit of how much you can perceive as a human. So here you can see, for example, that uh, you might be measuring this particular uh, plot for height, but you can only measure really one plant at a time, and you can only see up to a certain amount. At a certain amount of time or a height, you start to lose the actual um, height of the plant, and you can not get as much of the perception that you might get from a drone. In addition to that, we have an example here on the right where we had a field that to the person on the ground looked really nice. In fact, it looked very, very uniform. And when they flew it with a drone, they saw these really strange patterns of green and red streaking through the field. And that wasn't extremely visible to them um, until they were able to see it from the drone. And the drone then allowed them to understand that there was some unknown variation that was happening that was actually due to the field preparation done in this location. And so the drone pr would provide unique insights that were not possible uh, just by the human perception on the ground. Another constraint is temporal constraints. So sometimes you want to be going to the field multiple times to observe something that might be happening as the plants progress through this, the growing season. But the reality is it's really difficult to get out to the field multiple times to go collect these data. Who wants to walk the field time after time? And, and, and the reality is that very few people want to do that. So to be able to do that from a drone or from a different uh, digital method uh, is a much more efficient way of, of collecting the data. And then lastly, I want to point out that there are constraints to the, the actual labor itself. How many of you have been through the field and at the end of the day have been extremely dirty or covered in um, you know, uh, dust or, or, or spores? And you can see in, the, in this individual here, they're very coated with this uh, dark uh, soil from head to toe. And the reality is that uh, it's more pleasant in many, ca many cases to just take the drone to the field or to a different uh, robotic or other solution and take those digital data rather than having to go manually collect the data yourself. So we've been seeing these kinds of enhancements all the way through the history of, um, of plant breeding. So here in this particular example, we're showing you that uh, in the very beginning of our, of our company, Corteva, um, which was in the past called Pioneer Hybrid, um, this, it, these individuals are measuring the yield, um, utilizing a very rudimentary method of doing that, and 
collecting the data um, with a pen and paper here and measuring the, the yield. And this is very inefficient. If you think about this, this takes a lot of time per plot and a lot of energy, and you don't get a lot of data necessarily other than the weight of the total ears on, um, on the cob. Fast forward a few years, and now you have one row combines, which can go through the field, <clears throat> sorry, one plot combines, two row, one plot combines that can go through the field and collect a lot of data. And then if you want to double that, you actually go to two plot combines. So instantly you go uh, and you double the amount of data you're collecting in the amount of time. You go from that to even more automated um, methods of data collection through fleets of these um, combines that are, are pushed around through uh, more efficient methods. And then eventually you even um, don't even need possibly combines at all. And maybe you have a drone that can fly over a field and collect data and maybe eliminate the need for all of the combines. And that will eventually lead to the increase then in efficiency and yield gain. And so you can see here, this is more of a classic <clears throat> example from Troyer um, from 2004, where you can see basically yields are flat and plateaued and back in the um, before hybrid uh, corn breeding was was a, a real uh, adventure. And then you see that the rates in, increase with double cross hybrids and then single cross hybrids, an even faster rate of gain. And the reality is that 130 million hectares have been saved um, because higher yields provide more corn per unit area at a lower cost. And so this is an example where I think exactly what we're trying to do with our precision phenotyping methods today. But we have even more tools in the tool belt than just combines, right? So now we have uh, proximal sensing methods, whether those are sensors on the plants or sensors below the ground. We have drones, we have new novel sensor types like LIDAR or hyperspectral or multispectral data. We have mobile devices. We have obviously phenotyping machinery similar to the combine or we have um, satellites and all of these tools allow us to at a very high precise level take data within the field. Now if we go back to our breeder, so we'll say this individual is our breeder, our breeder is limited to what they can see with their eyes. So if the breeder is coming to this plot of soybeans and trying to understand how does this plot compare to other plots in the field, <clears throat> they need to first evaluate what they can see with their own eyes. So they start to think about the canopy cover, they look at the gaps, they look at the variation between plots, they look at the variation within plots, they look at greenness, canopy health, canopy height, and canopy volume. And they integrate all of these things in their mind at the same time, and they give it a score. And they say, this plot is probably a one. This plot is probably a five. And that's what they do as they then take data manually. And if you do that, you can end up with some very unique <laughs> kinds of results where you have one individual, one human scoring this particular block and you get this really red pattern. And then another human scoring this block right below that and you get a very green pattern. And the difference here is that the humans are differentially ca calibrated, that they have in their minds what they think is a, a, a one and they have in here in their minds what they think is a five at the same exact plot kind. <clears throat> So if you take the drone, you can remove a lot of that by um, quantifying a lot of these things. So you take these actual things that your brain quantifies and then you um, put them into individual quantifiable um, data points. And that allows you then to summarize all of these and weight them and say, how important do I think canopy cover is versus how, do I, how important do I think greenness is to the overall value of this plot? And that allows you then to um, identify the things that are most important when you're wh what a human would have said were the most important in their mind, you can actually quantify those individual components. And that can be extremely valuable as you go faster and faster through the field. So now you can fly over an entire location in a matter of minutes, drive a high scale, uh, all of the data you wanted to collect, and also more data than you ever would have collected individual uh, at, by yourself with your own human eyes. So we take our breeder now, we take them out to a cornfield, and we say, let's talk about corn planting, identifying the quality of the plots overall. And then 
<clears throat> here you can say you can see that the human can identify the plants with their eyes. They can count the plants. They can find and quantify how many gaps there are. They can estimate the uniformity of the stand, and they can measure the length of the plots overall. So that's what a human can do. But all of those steps take lots and lots of effort. Now, if you have the, the drone go over and do it, the drone can go and do this individually and, and, and quickly and over a very wide range of different soil types and different backgrounds and different um, uh, stress types, and they can quantify the gaps very quickly. So the models that we build need to be very highly um, uh, diverse. So they can, they can work with all the differences in the, uh, on the backgrounds that you can see. And they need to be able to distinct, distinguish between what a weed is and what a crop is. And with all this, we can start to drive uh, novel insights. So that things that weren't even plausible before. For example, we may not have measured routinely how many gaps or how big the gaps are between plants because that would have been very difficult to do, say, in an a stand establishment like this. But now you can easily quantify how far apart plants are and be able to identify how good a plot is uh, of this type versus this type, for example, and something that would be very difficult to have done just with stand count by itself. Similarly, you can measure hybrid um, corn yield. So here, our breeder would be out there measuring a yield in, um, in corn or possibly in sunflowers. And you can measure <clears throat> the height, for example, um, but you're limited. I'm sorry by the sample size. So you want to measure as many um, plots as you can, so you only measure a few plants within the plot, and that gives you um, the value. You also are measuring by eye. So again, how limited are you by what you can actually see? Now you take that and you start to uh, quantify instead with the drone, the height. And again, at scale, you can measure the entire canopy, which means you're not just measuring one plant, or a few plants in a plot, but you're measuring every plant within a plot. This can help you to predict uh, with in-plot variability. Um, we have seen improvements in the overall heritability, which means that you can select things more effectively and more efficiently. And of course, you get greater throughput because you can do this in a matter of minutes, whereas you would be doing it previously in many hours of data collection, which all this leads to better product selections. Now, again, our, our breeder is going to go and quantify iron chlorosis deficiency here. And um, here you can see the, the scale on which the breeder has been trained uh, to identify uh, what a really uh, chlorotic and diseased plot is versus one that's really highly um, uh, resistant to iron chlorosis deficiency. And here you can see that they're going to look and they're going to try to identify plants with their eyes. They're going to look for greenness, the canopy size. They're going to consider height and maintain a consistent rubric, which is difficult because look at the, if you just looked at um, plants that were sizes three, four, five, and six, by themselves, they're very, very similar. And so I have a hard time distinguishing between what a three, four, five, and six is. And I can guarantee you that in a, even the, the trained score would have a hard time doing this. And if you think about doing this now on thousands of plots throughout the day, you're going to get hungry, you're going to get tired, it's going to get hot. And so you're going to want to slow down throughout the day. And that's one of the reasons why we find that um, the drone is a really great way of um, get, getting past some of these obstacles. And so here you can see the drone can see the whole field at a time. It can standardize what a scoring their scoring rubric is. Um, it's extremely high throughput and very accurate. As you can see here, uh, the visual scores versus the drone scores have a very high level of accuracy. And of course, this can lead to novel insights. For example, you might be able to collect uh, more data, which allows you to, to drive more um, molecular marker associ trait associations. And so then you can start to find markers that might have been associated at a more fine scale in the past that now have a bigger and more pronounced effect on the phenotype. And then um, I wanted to show you uh, another example here. Our breeder is going to go and score soy maturity. Soy maturity is a very important trait in terms of placement of the products and sales to our customers. 
But to be able to quantify this, you have to go back many different times to the field as the plants start to senesce. So you go from a very, very full canopy to a fully senesced canopy, but that has taken you multiple days of walking through the field to be able to collect that trait. And so the breeder has to have several trips to the field and of course has to score based on the visual insight that they can see right in front of their face at the point in time. So they don't get the, they don't get the benefit of going back in time and seeing the time series, right? They only get to see what's right there in front of them at that point in time. And they decide, okay, is it senesced yet or is it, is it not? And so they have to have that. Um, and, you know, do I call this day the day of senescence or do I call the next one? And they don't have the benefit of having a time series in front of them. Whereas with the drone, again, you can fly all these locations multiple times and you can quantify the, um, the greenness over time and identify at what point in time does the greenness stop going down. So you start from a very green canopy to a very senesced canopy. And at some point in time that if you continue to fly, you're not going to see any less green Green, it's going to be continually this amount of brown. And so this allows you to quantify a time series very rapidly and very cost effectively. And then another example would be something that you collect, say, from, um, from the ears of, of a corn plot. So here you can see our breeder again is going to want to quantify, uh, he's going to score these ears. Um, the breeder can obviously harvest the ears and score them, they can shell them and count the kernels that are on them, but that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. So fast forward, now you can take your cell phone and you can snap a photo of these pile of ears and you can quickly identify um, the ears themselves and you can uh, start to count the, um, the actual kernels on the ears and also all the metrics around the size of the ears themselves. And that is again, very accurate. And this can greatly increase the throughput, um, ex expands it to a larger user base because basically everybody has a cell phone that they can use. And this is identified as a highly accurate method of data collection. Um, just to say that these are just a few of the tools that uh, we have in at our disposal. There are, of course, other things that are coming down the pipeline, whether that's an introduction of even bigger, better, faster drone types, um, or sensors that you can place in the field or on the crops, um, utilizing virtual reality and starting to, to utilize what you can see um, from a, a, a virtual world, or um, utilizing time series kinds of photos, or also um, going and taking robotics or other sensor types through the field to collect a lot of data at high scale. So we know that there are many more tools that are coming down the pipeline and um, our team is responsible for going and taking these and applying them to a breeding context. In addition to the proximal and the, um, the drones, we also have a lot of satellite imagery and data that are coming out. And this allows you to um, look at the resolution now on, at a location level and understand the environments. And so you can view, um, you can see crop growing through different stages. So the nice thing is you don't have to go out to the field and collect these data. As long as the satellites are overhead and the skies are clear, you're going to be able to collect data on the ground about what's happening in your field, which is really powerful because now you can start to understand the environment itself and you can understand the gene, the germplasm by environment interaction to find products that are stable across a very wide range of envir environment types. And so you take all of these different data inputs. And the important thing is you can think about, you know, environmental characterization, plant growth, plant stature, uh, plot quality and, and plant health. And then you, you marry that up with all of the data from the genetics, the genomics, the biotechnology and marker assisted selection uh, side of things. And, and you take those, put them together and you get better uh, varieties and optimized management decisions. And that will lead, of course, to better yield overall. But what is the real point of all of this? So if you think about, again, this, um, this uh, equation that we started off with, we really want to accelerate breeding responses by doing all these things. And 
the bottom line is from our company's perspective, we say that we want to enrich the lives of those who produce and those who consume, ensuring progress for generations to come. I think that's the key is that we want to ensure that for generations to come, we're going to be able to uh, produce the consistent yields that are, are needed. And it's not for us, but really it's for all the individuals throughout the world who, um, who produce and who consume the products that, that we sell. And so that gives you a little bit of an idea of the team that we work with. But um, I just wanna say that it is a, a pleasure to, to work on these new precision phenotyping uh, technologies and they're constantly evolving, which will drive this, this cycle even, even faster. So thank you for the time today. And I think uh, I'll turn it back over to you.